Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome back to the Duocast, where we recap last week's episode and we talk about all kinds of fun things that are happening in our lives. We solve political problems and basically deal with environmental cleanup issues and try to make the world a better place. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me back, man. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So we are here to talk about the David Magadoff interview. What'd you think of that chat? Oh, I thought it was a solid chat. It was a solid interview. Very funny too. David just has such a comedic way of explaining life and the events in his life and just seems to have this easygoing approach to uh, just living his life and finding opportunities in his career. And um, I realized I knew who that was. You know, I, I've seen him before in uh, the broke ass game show. Mm -hmm. I went back and I went back and watched some clips, but I, I had seen that before. I didn't know who that was, but uh, during the interview, during the episode, I found myself pretty much laughing out loud, like right along with you when I was listening to the episode, he's just extremely funny. And it's, it's nice to just get a good laugh in now and then. I think it's good for your health. And so when we have a guest on who can make you laugh, I think that's just a wonderful thing. Uh, the other part that I liked was the fact that he was actually in the process of shooting a revival to the show Dexter, which is actually one of my favorite shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was cool. I mean, to actually see him in a closet mm -hmm. on the set of Dexter surrounded by shirts and coats, you know, just for sound quality. Like I used to record my podcast, but to see him take time out of his day, a very busy six month shoot of season nine of Dexter, it was kind of cool. You feel like you're part of something special and you're kind of getting inside information about this show and he's sharing things with you that he's allowed to share, but he's holding back on things that Showtime will not let him reveal. Right. And that was kind of a fun part of the interview. I thought it was absolutely fun. I mean, you're a fan of the show, Dexter, right? I mean, you've watched it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, big fan. I, it was one of my favorite. It continues to be one of my favorite shows ever on television, right up there with HBO's The Sopranos, HBO's The Wire, Arrested Development. There are certain shows that just hold a place in television history Yeah, that are iconic and they are instant classics. And I will always have them in like my top five list of shows. Yeah. And Dexter's one of them. Yeah. I think I think I was telling you the other day that Dexter's my hero. <laughs> I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Killing bad guys. Yeah. We need more Dexters in the world to uh, kind of rid the planet of evil people. And, and even though Dexter himself has this evil streak and knows every way possible to kill you and dismember you and dispose of you, he uses that evil for good to fight true evil and get revenge. And I think it's just a great premise for a show. Yeah, it, it is. And to go back to your comment about David and the humor that he brought to the interview, mm -hmm. I appreciate that as well, because there's something, it's like when you're talking to someone who's just naturally funny, it's something that everyone kind of envies. I think there's part of us and all of us, we have this desire to want to be funny and to entertain and to be witty mm -hmm. and kind of like Jack Black's charisma. Right. David has that. You know, David has something special when it comes to charisma. And you see it in his reel, his SNL reel. Yes. Where he just goes through impersonation after impersonation. Yeah. And some of them are kind of like brutal and biting. And then some of them are a little more lighthearted, but they're they're all very spot on. And um and you're like, gosh, that is talent. And if I was going to be in entertainment, if I was going to choose between like being a great actor in drama versus comedy, I would 11 times out of 10 choose comedy. Yeah. I'd, well, you know, it helped him out too. I mean, MTV saw the reel and hired him to be a game show host. So it works out good for him. And, uh, I, you know, I've always wanted to, that's kind of one of my fantasies growing up was to work for MTV doing something. But, um, I think I'd be more of a behind the scenes guy because I'm not upfront funny all the time and I'm not good at doing it on the spot. You know what I mean? So yeah, I just, he just has a talent for it. 
I, I'm the type of guy like my kids think I'm funny. Uh-huh. You know, my wife thinks I'm funny sometimes, but I think sure. my kids think I'm funny more than my wife does. <laughs> and <laughs> I I have the ability to crack a joke or be witty here and there, but to be on all the time mm. and just to bring that very quick witted sense of humor to any situation like David does. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of admiration for folks that have that level of talent when it comes to comedy and, and improv. Yeah, me too. So today I wanted to share with you that I interviewed Jeffrey Paul King. Okay. If you don't know who Jeffrey Paul King is, he was a writer and a producer on a show called Elementary. Hmm. And Elementary was a uh, Sherlock Holmes spinoff type of show that was on CBS with Lucy Liu and uh, really well-written show, very smart show. And it takes a lot of intelligence to write smart storylines when it comes to like crime mysteries, that type of thing, especially Sherlock Holmes level shows. But anyway, that's his background. And he has a new show out on the CW, which is owned by CBS, I believe, Mm -hmm. called Republic of Sarah. And Republic of Sarah is about a fictional town in New Hampshire that declares independence. And I won't go into the details of why they declare independence, but they become kind of a sovereign country. Wow. And the town slash country is run by this woman named Sarah. That's why they call it the Republic of Sarah. And it's a, it's a really fun, heartfelt, funny show. And it's 42 minutes long, runs commercial free every Monday on the CW. And then uh, also you can get it online streaming for free the next day on Tuesdays. It's a fun series to watch with like your family or your kids. And he's just immensely talented. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about how that interview went and also launching it, see what our listeners think. Nice. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. I'm going to have to check that show out. It's one of those shows that it looks and feels kind of like Gilmore Girls. I don't know if you've ever watched Gilmore Girls, Mm -hmm. but Gilmore Girls has this very familiar, comfortable vibe where the set pieces are kind of like used a lot. Like there's a diner, there's a town square. And so you know this thing is being recorded on a set, but there's something really familiar and comfortable about those types of shows where you look at like a, a scene inside the diner and it's like, oh, I know this diner, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's always going to be there in the show. And that's kind of the way Republic of Sarah is. There's a diner, there's a, there's a town square, there's, you know, they do shoot on location here and there, but it's, it's a neat show. And I love talking to folks like Jeffrey who are show runners and show runners fascinate me because they seem to be like the hardest working people in the business. They're the people that are in the writer's room they are the the visionaries, you know, it's their show. They created it usually and um, working crazy hours and cranking out like a machine, these seasons, you know, 10 episode seasons, 13 episode seasons and doing it season after season. And where he cut his teeth in television is elementary for seven seasons in a row. Nice. And uh, so it's fun to talk to Jeffrey about that. Just personally, that's fascinating to me Yeah, is uh, folks who are able to get into television in that way and be so influential and create great television. Yeah, that that stuff just, it blows my mind, actually. So, um, Jason. Yes. What do we have coming up next? Uh, We have something that I've been looking forward to, an interview with Mark Pickerel. Okay. For my guests who don't know who Mark is, who is Mark Pickerel? Uh, He was involved with the Screaming Trees back in the day. Okay. One of my favorite bands. So basically, he is part of grunge history. Yep. Yeah. I I was just as excited as you are to talk to him and to hear his story. And the coolest thing about this whole experience of interviewing Mark is that when I talked to Mark, it was my first in-person, face-to-face interview since the pandemic began. Mm-hmm. And if you remember all the way back when I was at Sundance in January of 2020, and then uh, right after Sundance, we launched all of these episodes of these long form interviews that I did. I think I had eight of them recorded when I came out of Park City Mm -hmm. and returned to Washington. And then the pandemic hit and boom, no more face-to-face interviews. It all went to Zoom. That's right. And so now Mark's vaccinated, I'm vaccinated. He invited me into his antique shop in Ellensburg, Washington, 
and we sat there face to face with microphones old school, just like just like Park City, just like when I was flying down to Los Angeles to do these on a regular basis. And it felt so great to just be there in someone's creative space, someone like Mark, who is part of the fabric of the grunge rock movement that started in the mid 80s and extended all the way into the the 1990s. Yeah. Uh played with Nirvana, of course, was on the first five albums for the Screaming Trees, which are, you know, hugely influential band. Mm-hmm. Uh Uncle Anesthesia, he played on that album too, which was one of my favorite Screaming Trees albums. Nice. And then he has Mark Pickerel in his praying hands and also Mark Pickerel in the Peyote 3. And uh, as you know, I got a chance to see Mark play live in Yakima recently. So we talked about that. It's a great interview. And I think it's uh, fun to document history this way. And that's what I love about talking to historical figures. And I look at Mark like a historical figure, someone who really helped shape what grunge music, what Pacific Northwest rock looked like and felt like and the impact that it had on the rest of the country and the world, you know, he was part of that. So that was a lot of fun. That's absolutely awesome. You know, the thing I realized uh, when I started listening to that interview and being the person that produces it and has to edit the interview, um, I realized how difficult it is to edit face-to-face interviews, you know, with the background noise and all of the ambience and just kind of the crosstalk and everything that's going on in, in those conversations. I had basically forgotten all about it, forgotten how to do it. So <laughs> I, I kind of forgot about how noisy it was too, face to face. Yeah. And I'm, I've got my headphones on and, and Mark's doesn't have headphones on, but he's holding his mic and I'm sitting there in his, his office in this antique store and he's got this barn door open mm-hmm. and there's traffic driving by and I can hear the cars driving by. Yep. Every time I m- move my body, even an inch, you hear this the creak of the chair that I'm in and the creak of the chair that Mark is in. And yep. But you know what I figured? I chalked it up to the fact that this is just part of the character of the interview. Yep. And hopefully my listeners will forgive that type of noise and just accept the fact that I am in his space and what we lost in terms of audio quality, we actually gained a lot more in terms of the vibe and the connection that I made being face to face with Mark. Yeah. And that makes all the difference in the world right there. So I'm actually looking forward to finishing it. Yeah, me too. And then of course, Brian, you know, we've got Tommy Chong coming up. Tommy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a fun one. I was kind of surprised when Tommy got on the Zoom line. He was just holding his phone. He had logged into Zoom with his phone. He was holding the phone and I think he was like in his bedroom. (laughs) So I could see Clothes in the background, laying on his bed, like you know, his guitars hanging on the wall. Mm-hmm. There were folks, uh, folks walking in and out of the room here and there. But he was so in it; he was so engaged. And I think what Tommy really enjoys at the age of eighty-three is just connecting with people and telling his story. Yeah, and he kept talking and talking, and it was so fun. I I did have a hard time keeping Tommy on track a little bit because. <laughs> he is able to he's able to spin so many tales. He's collaborated with so many different people and he has so many stories to share that you ask him one thing uh on a very discreet subject, a very narrow subject and he ends up answering your question kind of, <laughs> but then veering off into other areas that he wants to go. And then an hour and a half in, I had to wrap it up. I mean, right. I was getting tired and you know, I'm not 83 years old. <laughs> he was ready to go another hour. <laughs> So this guy has incredible stamina. No kidding. Uh, you know that uh, inability to concentrate on one particular subject. There might be something to do with that with Tommy Chong. <laughs> Could be. Maybe it's his his brand of marijuana that he's yeah he's actually using on the job. Yeah, yeah. I, it tends to do that. It makes you a little rambly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's on brand. Yeah, which is great. I'd, very very on brand for Tommy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I. I'd listen I'd listen to him ramble all day long. Yeah, it's going to be a fun interview. It's a little different than most of my interviews because we talked about subjects that were let me put it this way, we veered off into subjects that I did not expect. So there are going to be some surprises 
for folks who listen to that interview. Okay. It doesn't necessarily follow the the typical biographical arc that I try to follow <laughs> or that organically just my curiosity takes me there. Right. I'm basically chasing Tommy throughout the interview and going where he goes and trying to follow up with questions the best I can. Yeah. But he's got so much energy <laughs> and you know, I really wanted to talk to him more about his prison sentence and what he gained from you know, the wisdom that he gained from that whole chapter in his life. Right. And, um, you know, what he gained, what he lost. But what I found was when I was researching Tommy Chong is that there's tons out there already Yes, about his prison time. In fact, there's a documentary out there called, also known as Tommy Chong. I think it's called a- AKA Tommy Chong. It's a good documentary out in 2011. Mm-hmm. And uh, in plenty of interviews where he talks about his prison sentence. And so what I thought was don't push it. Don't be artificially pushing this in a direction where it doesn't need to go. Just go wherever Tommy wants to go with it. And that's where we went. And it was, uh, I think, a pretty good interview. Uh, It's going to be one of your legendary interviews, Brian. I hope so. I think every interview is legendary in its own right. Truly. Because what happens when I interview folks that I love about this podcast and what I love about the process is that people are opening themselves up in a way. They're exposing their underbelly. Mm -hmm. They're being vulnerable in a way that you don't see in other formats. And it's not, it's not because of me or anything special that I'm doing. Right. But you know, when you're telling your story and you're talking about your ups and downs, and we saw this with Moby, especially Mm -hmm. where the dark moments are just as important as the successes and highlights right. to talk about. Yes. I mean, that's any good biography that you read is going to show the challenges just as much or maybe even more so than the highlights, which just frankly aren't that interesting sometimes. Right. It's true. You know, you talk to uh, an Academy Award winning director and, you know, tell us what it was like to get up on stage and receive that Academy Award. That's boring. <laughs> you know, tell me about the time that you failed that you tried to get a movie off the ground and it didn't work out. Tell me about the time when you got fired and you didn't think you were ever going to be able to go back and work in this industry again. Right. You know, what did you do to overcome that? I think that's a much better, more intriguing and compelling story than the successes. And so, you know, talking to Tommy, not to belabor the point too much because this episode is going to launch pretty soon, but Tommy actually had a lot of challenges in his life, legal challenges challenges in his relationship with Cheech mm-hmm. and, you know, there lots of clashes and failed marriages and, you know, a run-ins with the law and prison time. So he's got a lot to share with us about those experiences that I think listeners will find pretty compelling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't wait to sit down and tackle this and get a chance to listen to it, put it together for you. And uh, I know it's going to be great. It's always great to reconnect with you and go over last week's episode, talk about what's coming up next. It's it's just really fun to be on this journey with you, my friend. I'm having a blast, Brian. Thank you. All right. You have a good weekend. You too, man. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.